Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 5th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain why we think legislators have lost touch with the economics facing middle and lower income, 80% of Alaska families. Second, while Governor Dunleavy seems to understand some of the issues facing middle and lower income Alaska families, we explain why he's failing to do anything about it, but that there is some glimmer of hope that others are. Third, We explain why the discussion around Alaska fiscal policy is becoming like Orwellian newspeak. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Bradley, let's uh, let's dive into it, my friend. We got uh, we got some we got some serious ground to cover this morning, Um, and so let's uh, let's get into it. Taxation without representation, of course, we know famously that that is one of the whole reasonings and, uh, and uh, you know, justifications for the Revolutionary War and uh, the pushback against the federal government. Those are some, those are some strong words, Brad. What do, what do we got here? Give me, the, give me your thoughts on what's going on. Well, I'm not, I'm not intending them all the way in that context. But last week, I was listening to the budget presentations before the, the various fi- the finance committees, the Senate mm-hmm. Finance Committee and the House Finance Committee. And as I listened to the finance committee and listened to the questions and listened to the discussion, um, I sat there thinking more and more that this group is just out of touch. I mean, they were complaining about they were complaining about the the budget format and how it was showing deficits in all those future years. And they didn't want it to show that. (laughs) And so they started talking about, oh, we need to redo the the law that, that governs how you present budgets. So they don't they don't look like this. We want and, you to hide our deficits in the future because we just I don't want la 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 you know right sticking their fingers in their ears. And so and so the more the more curious I got, I've had this notion in the back of my head for a while, but I got really curious about the economic situation that that the members of the finance committees, indeed the members of the legislature in general, face, and and whether that's realistic, whether that's a representation. Um, of Alaska, especially after the uh, pay raise they gave themselves uh, last session. So I dug into it, uh, and you can find all the information you need on the APOC reports. Those are self-reported legislative finance uh, public disclosures, self-reported public disclosures by the legislators themselves about the sources and extent of their income. Um, and so I dug into those using the House Finance Committee as a, as a microcosm of the legislature, I could have used House leadership, I could have used the House minority, I could have used Senate finance, I could have used any of them. They're all about the same as I sampled through. But I dug in, the House finance is really, this is where this sense really hit me. And so I dug into House finance. Uh, and ultimately it turned into the column for the week uh, for the landmine. The head, headline is, is the fact that legislators live in a much different economic world than 80% of Alaska families leading to deep PFD cuts. And, and what I found as I, as I went through and analyzed the, 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 the income of the legislators is that looking at their income, they're out of touch with average Alaska families. 
Um, they, they report their income in a range. They include, it's line item. And so their legislative salary is in there. And so the PFDs they receive is in there. And so to do the analysis, I backed out the legislative salary if they reported because the latest reports are 2022 under the old legislative salary scheme. I backed out the legislative salaries and, and put in the new legislative salaries that took effect the first of this year. And because I wanted to analyze the impact of PFD cuts on them, I backed out the old PFD and I in, included a full PFD uh, because you need to do that in order to analyze the impact of, of compare PFD cuts, the impact of PFD cuts against, against other revenue options. And then I, I took that, that um, uh, income for each of, the, each of the members of House Finance, and I looked at it, and, and I looked at what the impact on them was of four different funding approaches, four different revenue approaches. The first was a flat tax, and, I, and you can get the flat tax out of, interestingly enough, out of the legislative finance, or legislative finance division's overview of the governor's uh, annual budget. Uh, they they talk about in there, there's a sentence in there, an analysis in there of how much uh, a flat tax would need to be to raise so much dollars. And you can scale it up or scale it down as you, as need fit, as the need arises. So I look at, at at the impact on them of a flat tax to raise the revenue that they've been talking about ra raising. I looked at the impact on POMV 5050. POMV 5050 doesn't raise all of the revenue that they've been talking about needing. So you have to find some way to 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 get that additional revenue. And you can't use additional PFD cuts or else it wouldn't be P POMB 50-50. So I used a flat tax to fill in that remaining gap after uh, after POMB 50-50. And then I looked at HB 156, which is Representative Galvin's claimed income tax. Um, it's not really, it's just sort of thin veneer of income tax on top of a head tax. Uh, but I looked at HB 156, that doesn't raise enough revenue. So you have to, you have to fill in the gap and I filled in that gap with a PFD cut. And then I looked at POMB 2575, which is the Senate's proposal and the proposition that a lot of the House members, well, in fact, the majority of the House members voted for at the end of last session in connection with voting to approve the budget. And looked at the impact on them under, under those four uh, revenue alternatives. The flat tax, it turns out, the flat tax took the most of all of the options for all of them. Uh, for all of the members of the of the House Finance Committee, they paid the most under a flat tax. The next most uh, under um, uh, 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 HB one well, some of them paid the next most under HB one fifty six. Some of them paid the next most under POMB fifty fifty. They paid the least. All of the legislators paid the least under POMB twenty five seventy five. That is, they were the best off personally. By by they 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 gave up the less the least government by uh, by passing POMB twenty five seventy five so it was in their best interest to pass POMB twenty five seventy five as opposed to any of those other revenue measures and Michael's got the got the chart up you can see you can see the impact I looked especially at Sarah Hannon who uh, who really upset me last year when she talked about you know the free ride of the PFD and looked at the impact on her. And you can see that the flat tax affects her the most and POMB, uh, POMB, HB 156 would affect her the least, but POMB 2575 is pretty close. All right, so I did that for the legislators. And then I went and looked at what the impact is on the remaining 80%, all the legislators in the top 20%, by the way. Once they pass the legislative, the salary increase, it moved them all into the top 20%. Um, and so then I went and looked at what the impact of these various revenue revenue measures are on the remaining 80% of Alaska families, the upper income, middle 20%, the lower middle 20%, and the low 20%. And those numbers are, are fascinating. Those numbers show that for every income category, the flat tax takes the least of all, of all the four revenue measures, the flat tax takes the least. That's the revenue measure that took the most out of the members of the, of the House Finance Committee. And then you go through and you see that POMB 5050 takes the next least. Uh, Elise Galvin's would take uh, the next least uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, all of the members. It's sort of a wash at, middle, at, the, at the upper middle 20%. But for the rest of the measures, it takes, it takes more than POMB 5050. 
certainly more than a flat tax for the other 80% of Alaska families. And POMV 2575, every income bracket, upper middle, middle, lower middle, and low 20%, every income bracket, POMV 25 takes the most. So you compare those two and what's going, and, and you compare the impact of the two for the, for the house finance members, flat tax would take the most. POMB 2575 takes the least for the majority right. of the House Finance Committee members. Well, and I think we need to talk about the numbers. So House Finance, the average take, the flat tax is always 4.1% based on your numbers. That's what it would take from everyone. But the POMV 2575 only takes 1.8% of their income from House Finance members based on their average income. Whereas the lower 20%, it would take 18%. Lower middle, almost 9%. Middle 20%, 6%. Upper middle 20%, 4.8%. So we're talking about two and a half times a tax what, uh, in the upper middle than what the house finance uh, you know, top 20% would be making uh, or 18% for the low. I mean, this is, these are huge numbers. They are. And, and, and they're, hugely, they're hugely telling. I mean, what it tells you is all of the members of House Finance, indeed, all of the members of the legislature after the pay increase they gave themselves, all of them are benefiting, uh, benefit the most in terms of a revenue measure from eight, from POMB 2575, either POMB 2575 or Elise Galvin's bill. But, but that takes the least for the majority of the House Finance Committee members, POMB 2575, and on average for the House Finance Committee members, POMB 2575, takes the least, but it takes a huge amount from, from the remaining 80%, from the upper middle, middle, lower middle, and, and low 20% of Alaska families. Flat tax takes the most from the House Finance Committee members, but it takes the least from the remaining 80% of Alaska families. So, I, you know, some people could sit here and say, look, so what's really going on when you boil it all down? What's really going on in the legislature is they're going through Kabuki Theater and they end up voting themselves the least impactful revenue measure on them. You get to the end of the legislature, the Senate, the Senate blew through uh, POMB 2575. The House, the House agreed to it. That was the least impactful on them. They voted to take the least amount out of their pockets, but the most amount out of the other uh, 80 percent of Alaska families. I'm not sure that that they're that that you can say that that they are as a body voting in, in, intentionally in their self-interest. But what I do think it says is that they're out of touch. They, by, particularly with the pay raise they just voted themselves, they voted themselves into a pay bracket that is into an income bracket that is out of touch with the other 80% of Alaska families. And they're not feeling the same economic impact of these measures at all. They're not feeling the same economic impact of these measures as the remaining 80% of Alaska families. And as I said, there's no, <laughs> there's not even an upper middle on the legislature anymore. Given the pay increase they've given themselves, they're all in the top 20%. There's no one from the other 80% in the legislature. The governor's not in the other 80%. Right. No one, no one, in, no one in, in the, in the 60 in the legislature or in the one that's the governor, no one is in the other 80%. So, it raises the question in my mind, do we have taxation without representation? Do we have these people, these legislators adopting revenue measures that are that that benefit them hugely, benefit them um, and 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 protect them. But the other 80 percent of Alaska families who are getting hit hardest with the revenue measure they're using don't have doesn't have anybody there to 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 protect their interests, to at least articulate their interests as a as, as part of the committee deliberations. So I it, it's it's a really, I mean, this analysis, I think, is really odd. I mean, we've got a legislature that is that is protecting itself at the expense of the other 80% of Alaska families. It's uh, when you look at the numbers, you realize how stark and how dramatic it is. Again, 18 percent, 18 and a half percent tax on the lowest income earners 
and a 1.8% on the highest income earners uh, and everybody else in between is getting gouged as well. It's a pretty uh, it's a pretty stark reality when you look at it. And like you said, maybe not intentionally, but the ancillary effects are the same. It doesn't really matter whether it's intentional or not. That's what's uh, that's what's going on. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. There's more to this article. You can go out and look at it at the landmine. Uh, it's his latest piece uh, posted uh, on Friday. Uh, fair, uh, Brad Keithley's chart of the week is what it's called. I've got links up in the chat room. You can go take a look at it. You had another chart on there, so we didn't get a chance to get to it. But I think it's also very telling. I'm going to go ahead and pull that one up. Uh, so that people can uh, so people can take a look at it real quick as well. Maybe you can explain what we're looking at uh, in this chart as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this so is, this, this sorry, is pretty telling. I'm just going to say this is pretty telling right here. So this is the one where I mean, I I need to do something graphic every week as part of the chart of the week. So I just put I took the table charts and I put them into a graphic chart. And the graphic chart, the the four bars represent the four different the four different revenue options: the flat tax, the POMV fifty fifty, the 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 Elise Galvin bill, and then POMV seventy five uh, twenty five seventy five is in uh, is in green. And I charted the impact as a percent, as a share of income, uh, the way you do any tax, as a share of income uh, for each of the members on the left, and then for the remaining eighty percent of Alaska families by income bracket on the right. And, and, and so you can see in, in bar form the impact of each of the revenue measures on any given legislator, and you can see in bar form the, the impact of each of the uh, revenue measures on the other 80% of Alaska families. And, and the slope on the bars um, uh, for, the, for the revenue measure, for the uh, fiscal, uh, finance committee members is downward. That is, that is flat tax is the highest, and then it slopes down to POMB 2575 for mo most of the members and on average for most of the members as being the lowest. The slope on the right side, same, same order of the bars, the slope on the right side for the other 80% of Alaska families is up, <laughs> which means that, that the flat tax, the 4.1% flat tax is the lowest impact on, on the other 80% of Alaska families, and then it slopes up to where POMB 2575 is the highest. And Michael's been referring to the impact on the low, lowest 20%. And that's that that's the bar that really throws everything off here. It shows it's a huge, huge impact of POMB 2575 on the lowest, on the lowest 20%. Right. So it's just it's a graphic way of, of presenting the same information. Yeah, there, which I think a lot of times gives you a real perspective instead of just raw numbers. You can look at the actual graphic and go, ow. Uh, I mean, just ow. <laughs> When you look at it, it's definitely definitely uh, painful when you when you look at it that way. There, there's one other there's one other use that this that this graph in particular uh, is useful for. Four point one, the, the flat tax rate is the average impact across all Alaska families. That's what a flat tax is. You take the same as a percent as a share of income from all Alaska families. So it's the average rate across all Alaska families, and in when you when you use a revenue measure that's lower than the average, that means somebody's paying less than the average, and it and it also means that somebody's paying more than the average in order to subsidize that that shortfall that's occurring with with whoever's paying less than the average. So you can look across the bar and you can see that all of the under the very under all of the various revenue options other than, other than flat tax, all of the members of the House Finance Committee are paying less than the four point one percent. They're paying less than the average impact on all uh, on all uh, uh, on uh, under all the revenue measures all the the other 80 percent of alaska families upper middle upper middle middle lower middle and the low 20 percent are all paying above 4.1 percent under all of the rev other revenue options they're all paying above average and what's going on is this cro what 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 economists and what people in the tax world call talk about is cross subsidies the the other 80 percent are paying this huge cross subsidy more than the average, so that the so that the upper twenty percent, including the House Finance Committee members and all the legislators, so that so that the other so that the upper twenty percent can pay less. What's the real free ride of a of the Alaska fiscal system? Is that the 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 upper the 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 other eighty percent are, are paying more 
they're they're creating a free ride that the House Finance Committee members and the upper 20% are, are taking advantage of. Sarah Hannon is a recipient of the free ride. She's not she's not a giver of the free ride. She is a recipient of the free ride. Free rides die hard, my friend. All right. <clears throat> I just, that quote is so awesome. I love how Randy says, I'm in the bottom 80% and I work out of cold in my job and I'm not willing to pay a state income tax. Let me, uh, let me just go back to this. Uh, let me just go back to this chart for you here, uh, 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 Randy. Take a look at that chart. Where do you fall on that chart? Are you in the middle, the lower or the middle 20% income bracket? Look at what you're paying already. You're paying the green line right now. Okay. Let me, let me real quick here. Let me, let me look at this. So what is the median income? The median income, uh, for, uh, for the upper, for the middle, uh, 69,000. So you're either making over 41,000 or you're making, you know, up to $70,000 a year. Okay. That would be the middle, that would be the middle 20%. Uh, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to this chart again here. So if you're in the middle or the lower, look at those green lines. That's what you're paying right now, Randy. You're either paying you're paying between 6.1 and 8.9% of your income towards with that PFD cut. That's what you're paying right now. And you're saying, "Oh, I don't want to pay 4.1% because I wouldn't get you would still have a net increase of between 2 and <clears throat> almost 4% of your income." So, there you go. I mean, you know, there you go. If that's if that's what you want to get to, I I mean I just don't know what to say to you, Randy. You're already paying. You're already paying right now. Would it be less in the in the end or not? I don't know. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Um, ben Carpenter says we also. I'm sorry, Brad. You want to say something? Go ahead. Well, I yeah yeah. I, all I want to say is this: Randy's not only not only paying more, he's paying to subsidize Sarah Hannon. Sarah Hannon is paying less because Randy pays more. Sarah Hannon's paying less than the average because Randy's paying more than the average. If yeah. he wants to subsidize Sarah Hannon, I have no problem with that. Cut her a check, write her a check directly. But don't take it out of the other 80% of Alaska families. Don't take the dollars out of the pockets of the other 80% of Alaska families in order to subsidize Sarah Hannon. Yeah. Uh, ben Carpenter says, we also don't talk enough about growing our economy as a revenue generation option. Why is that? Well, because the public and the private economy are completely divorced in this state because there is no connective tissue between the public and the private economy. They don't care what happens in the private economy because they don't draw any revenue source from that. It doesn't matter. That's why we're not talking about growing our economy. The only economy they're talking about growing is the government economy. They talk about growing that all the time with no connection to reality of where does that money come from? Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Defined benefits. Yeah. Defined benefits. We need that for our government employees. The private sector employees. Yeah. I don't know. Kind of pound saying. I don't know if they need it or not. I don't know. I don't care about them. I care about the government employees. Yeah. No, I mean, it's uh, it's obvious. We're on to number two of the weekly top three. Uh, Brad, um, hit us with it. What is number two? Well, number two is, is sort of this juxtaposition that we had in the press. It's not much of a juxtaposition, a, a, a difference that we had in the press. It's not much of one. But but I, I I saw I saw a small bloom on on the issue that I talk about the most, and I and I wanted to I wanted to highlight it. I wanted to give credit to it. So Governor Dunleavy wasn't it wasn't Governor Dunleavy that caused the bloom, but 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 it, to set it up to set the juxtaposition up, I need to talk about Dunleavy. So Dunleavy, in his State of the State, gives a you know speech about resource development and about all sorts of all sorts of great things, education and, and other stuff, and he gets to the end. And, and he starts talking about the manager of the subway store on Government Hill and how she's representative of the real Alaskans, the ones that go to work every day, the ones that don't have, aren't able to hire lobbyists, the ones that aren't able to uh, uh, get out there and, and you know, be political um, to, you know, take the time to go down to Juneau to lobby, the, to, to talk to the members, just an everyday, ordinary, run-of-the-mill Alaskan highlights her and says, you know, she's the one that we should be here for. She's the one that, you know, that that to to whom the PFD is important. She's the one. That's the that's the guts of Alaska that we need to be worrying about. 
right there. Um, and it's a really, I mean, it's a good segment of the speech. It's the end of the speech. He didn't highlight it much, but it's the end of the speech. And it's a really, it, it's a, it's a good way of, of, uh, of talking about it. And, you know, looking at the chart that we had in segment one, she's the other 80% of Alaskan. She's the ones for whom the PFD takes the most. Using the PFD cuts as a revenue measure takes, uh, takes the most. But he doesn't go ahead. He never goes, well, he did last spring, but he hasn't since gone ahead and said, and we need to do something about that because we continue to re run these deficits. L he should have said, look at my budget. We're continuing to run deficits through the end of the decade. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. The only way to the only way that, that, that we've left out there to fill them is PFD cuts. He didn't go ahead and say, and we need to do some revenue redesign in order to make sure that we're not taking any more from her than we're taking from any other Alaska family in the top 20% or anywhere else. Right. That that's what he should have gone ahead and said, but he doesn't. He just talks about, yeah, she she's important. She's the one for, for whom we ought to be fighting. She's the one that, that you know, for whom the PFD is important, but we're not going to do anything for her. <laughs> we just I just wanted to highlight her and I just wanted to get her out there. It's not it's not like, you know, it's not like we really consider it. And then you go through the rest of the press over the course of the week. And there's this editorial that's in the Alaska Beacon from all of the great luminaries of K through 12 about it's time for a significant per student increase in Alaska school funding. Then you get Kathy Giesel talking about how it's time for defined benefits. And then you get Julie Cologne talking about how it's time for, you know, state subsidized child care through a, through a tax credit. She'll say, Oh no, it's private business. We're just going to give them a tax credit. Well, a tax credit is a state subsidy gang. And, you know, and she talks about how important that is. I do want to highlight one thing though. In the Frontiersman, there was an editorial written by uh, the Alaska Council of School Administrators, and it go and it says the K through 12 fiscal cliff. Who's responsible? Everyone. I thought, well, okay, that's an interesting headline. Let me read that. If everyone's responsible for the fiscal cliff, what are they going to say about who pays? And and 99.9% .9 of it is about is about how the, oh, great. I just, I just clicked off the, uh, hang on a second. 99.9% .9 of it is about um, how important it is to increase the BSA, to increase payments to, to, to K through 12. You just can't do it to teachers. You got to do it to school staff too. And just, you know, it goes on and on and on about how important it is. But here is the last set, the very, very last sentence. You got to fight through the entire editorial and all of the all the repetition to get down to this last sentence but here's the last sentence the fiscal cliff is here we are we are all responsible and we must all do something we and others will be advocating for k through 12 funding indeed they are and th these are the key words last set last words of the editorial and are willing to pay an income tax <laughs> that's the first time i have seen any and the only time, not only the first, but the only time I've seen any of the K through 12, you know, industry, any of them say that they're willing to uh, willing to pay something uh, 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 toward themselves, all of whom are in the top 20 percent, all the administrators are will, willing to pay themselves toward the costs of, uh, of, of funding K through 12. Only time. And it's what is it? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. That's the only time. Justin Refridge at a at a House um, was it House Finance at a committee meeting committee hearing uh, yesterday, uh, where all the BSA argument was being presented. Maybe it was education, but it was it was a, a the hearing was on how, how we need to increase the the K through twelve. Or it turned into a committee hearing on for the for the speakers uh, talked about how we need to increase K through twelve. Justin Refridge asked a couple of the speakers couple of the testifiers, well, how do you want to pay for this? You want deeper PFD cuts? You want you want to increase oil taxes? You want to overdraw the permanent fund earnings reserve? Or you, you, want, to, you want to pay for it yourselves? They didn't answer. <laughs> they dodged the question. They went out and talked yeah. about something else. Yeah, no, that's not a question that they want to answer. But it is their solution to everything. Uh, uh, reading that piece in the Alaska Beacon uh, from all these people who were part of uh, – 
what do they call it? Raise the AKBSA, a group of parents, educators, support staff, and paraprofessionals who are advocating for raising the base student allocation. They go on. There's one seg. There's one. There's one paragraph in this uh, uh, in this uh, editorial that I wanted to highlight when I read it. Uh, it says, you know, to increase the BSA, to improve student outcomes, to raise the BSA, to invest in our use, to raise the BSA, to attract businesses, to raise the BSA to strength. And that goes on for a whole paragraph about how this is the end all be all. This is the thing we've been looking for. I mean, it's just it's become a mantra. I mean, this is like a religious fervor at this point. If you are not about raising the BSA, you are a heretic. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's a religious mm -hmm. fervor, but they don't want to convert. I mean, they don't, they don't right, want to. Right. As long as the peasants pay, they're okay. And, and the, and the peasants, I mean, I, I want to go back to that chart one more time from the first segment. As long the peasants are the other 80% of Alaska families. It's the other 80% of Alaska. You know, sometimes some people say, oh, I'm in the upper middle. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll be okay. No, you're overpaying too. That's, that's what the chart shows. It, the chart shows that every income bracket, except the top 20%, and the legislators have made sure they're all in the top 20% now. Every income bracket other than the top 20% is paying more by using something other than a flat tax uh, and, and paying the most by using POMB 2575, the legislature's right. preferred preferred alternative. Well, I mean, look, uh, you know, uh, uh, credit where credit's due, at least Ruffridge asked the question of who's going to pay and how are you going to pay for it? And no, I mean, the fact it's very telling that nobody wants to answer. It was the same thing on the on the defined benefits. Nobody wants to talk about how much it's going to be. I mean, it passes out of committee without a note. I mean, it's just we've got to have it. It's going to save us. It's going to it's the one thing that's going to keep us going and put a chicken in every pot. But no idea of how we're going to pay. Same thing with the BSA. The same freaking thing with the BSA. Nobody knows. Nobody wants to talk about it. And, and, you know, if they, if they, and the reason they don't want to talk about it is because they know if they did talk about it, that, that even some of them would oppose it because they don't want to pay a tax. Oh no. As long as we can shove the costs off on the other 80% of Alaska families, it's great. It's a chicken in every pot. It is the be all and end all. But wait, you want to make me pay for part of it? No, wait, the cost benefit isn't, isn't working here for me. So, so as long as we can get everybody else to pay for it, we think it's a great thing. I, I give credit. I give credit to these, to the to the authors in the in the frontiersmen for at least having the guts to face up to the issue and say that they're willing to pay an income tax. Now they didn't say how much of an income tax. You know, at least Galvin says she's willing to pay an income tax, but it's this thin veneer on top of the on top of a huge head on top of a huge head tax. It's on top of an even deeper PFD cut that you need to that you need to complete all the funding. But at least they said, you know, they're willing to do something. They're willing to contribute something toward the solution of the problem. The rest of these people, they just want they just want it solved. They want somebody else to pay for it. That that's their their solution is solve it on the backs of somebody else. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm done. It's, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that's, this is the problem. And we've been harping on this for a while, but again, nobody in the legislature is still answering this question. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, okay, great. You want all this stuff. You want all the bells and whistles, whatever it is, fill in the blank to find benefits or, you know, whatever. How are we going to pay for it? Let's go back to number one. Well, we don't want to see this whole budgetary thing where there's deficits going out. We don't want to see that. But that's the yeah, that's what we all have to face. We all have to face that in our personal lives, in our business lives. We have to face, you know, deficits and everything else. I mean, you just want us to hide it all from you and pretend that it's all just going to be fine. That's exactly what they want. That's exactly that was the. I mean, that's the thing that just really got me going on this issue. That was the tenor of the discussion, and it wasn't just Democrats. I mean, Bryce was leading it, but Delena was part of it. I mean, it 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 it's all of them. They're all just you know living in this other world about, you know, we know it'll be better. We know we'll make the PFD cuts. So let's just not tell anybody how deep the deficits are or how deep the PFD cuts, how deep the PFD cuts are. are. Let's just, I'll tell you what's going to happen, uh, what they want. They just want to take the permanent fund earnings and the whole POMB draw and just stick it into revenue and forget about the PFD. And then they'll say, oh, we're done. We've, we've got this covered. In fact, we got money to spare. We got money to burn. You want, 
You want to increase the B3, the, the, the BSA? Fine, we'll do that. You want to increase, you know, defined benefits? Fine, we'll do that. You want to do child care uh, uh, credits? Fine, we'll do that. Because we got all this money to burn. <laughs> For a couple of years, and then it'll be, oh, you Alaskans, you really need to pay your fair share. You've been getting a free ride. You know, we all need to pull together and everybody needs to feel, we all need to feel that, you know, you, you know, it's coming. You know, it's coming. I mean, it's inevitable. Yeah. And they, and they act like it's, <clears throat> and they act like they can just wish it away. And when we get there, it's going to be a tax. <laughs> it's going to be a tax like Elise Galvin's, which is this thin veneer of a tax so that we can say we have a tax. But then this head, this, this head tax that's sitting on top of a huge PFD cut below it, uh, that's, that's paying for it. And they'll say, Oh, we got a tax now. It doesn't affect us much, but we got a tax now. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, what was one of the comments? And I, I caught this. Did I highlight it? I, I think I highlighted it in this. Oh yeah. It was this article in the ADN talking about yesterday's meeting where they all talked about how they need, Oh, we've got these impacts. They had all the school people in there about how it was so hard and it was so bad. And, we need all this thing. And uh, I loved how they were basically saying they made a quote in there. We have a hundred and where is it? Um, we had 158 school support positions that are empty right now. And all I could think of was good. What we need is teachers, not school support, not, you know, not all these other ancillary administrative positions. What we need is more teachers. And they're worried about 158 empty support positions. I mean, come on. I, I understand some of these things probably makes it more helpful and blah, blah, blah. But some of that is just inertia. I mean, when I went to high school, there was a principal, a vice principal, the office staff, and a guidance counselor. That was it. I mean, there was 50 teachers and there was 12 support staff. Now it's 50 teachers and 100 support staff. Where do you think all the money's going? Just do the math on that. Sorry, I'm getting a little wrapped up here. Well, good. And, and to Ben's point, so we have this, we have a hearing day devoted to K through 12, devoted to all the impacts on K through 12. Do we have a similar hearing day about small businesses? Do we, do we have the manager of the government Hill subway down to talk about the impact on her of her of PFD cuts? Do we have, do we have people from small businesses in Anchorage or, or Bethel or Fairbanks or, or Wasilla come down to talk about? No. <laughs> we, because to Ben's point, we don't care about government. We don't care about small business. We only care about right. government. We right. only care about our employees. Yeah, maybe we're affecting you by our people, but, but we don't want to hear about that. Just like we don't want to hear about the deficits anymore. We don't want to hear about that. So we're not going to, we're not going to hold a hearing for you. We're just going to hold a hearing for government because that's all we really care about. Final segment, Brad Keithley, who has evoked George Orwell. I don't know if this would be like Godwin's law where everything gets compared to Nazis. Maybe there's an Orwellian law where everything gets compared to George Orwell. But I think this is some interesting stuff. So let's uh, let's get started here, Brad. Um, let's talk about your thoughts on maybe George Orwell is applicable to what's happening here in the uh, in the state of Alaska in their fiscal plan. Well, there's there's two there's two senses that that people leap to when you when you say Orwell. One is totalitarian government, and the second is Newspeak, the use of language to control thought. And I'm not talking about the first. <laughs> I, I want to make that perfectly clear. I'm not comparing Alaska to the totalitarian, totalitarian state that, that Orwell talked about in 1984. But I am going to talk about comparing Alaska, Alaska's fiscal language to, to, uh, to Newspeak, the creation of a Newspeak uh, that people are trying to do. This started last week <clears throat> in a conversation I was having with somebody about what was going on down, down in the legislature. And they were using the term surplus, that we had a surplus, a 1980, uh, a, a 2024, at a, at a fiscal year 2024, we had a surplus. And the supplemental was not spending to the, the supplemental the governor proposed, didn't use up all of the surplus that, that uh, the legislature had uh, available to it. And so there was room in the surplus you see a theme here. There was a room in there was room in the surplus to add on additional uh, FY24 spending, and they would certainly be advocating advocating for uh, for you know going back to 24 and adding in some spending there to lessen the load on FY25, a, a, a fiscal trick that the people sometimes use. And I finally got tired of this discussion of a surplus, and and I said, "What the hell are you talking about surplus?" Well, 
they cut so much of the PFD. They cut even more of the PFD in FY24 than they needed just to balance the budget. They cut it even deeper. They went to PLMB 2575, which wasn't necessary to balance the budget, but they went all the way there. And the additional revenue they created out of that creates a surplus in the regular budget. And, and so now they're talking about this surplus and, and creating all the, all the understanding you have when, when, you, when people talk about, talk about surpluses. We have a surplus in the budget. Oh, my God, what are we going to do about the surplus? How can we spend the surplus? We don't want to leave money behind uh, in, in the year. You know, we can use that money. for. And it just, it just drove me crazy. And as, I, and as I'm thinking about it, it finally dawned on me what's going on it, down in Juneau is we're having the creation of a new speak where budget deficits, as long as you cover them out of a deep enough PFD cut, as long as you transfer the deficit out of the regular budget into the PFD by cutting the, B, the PFD, where deficits become surpluses. And it, and it took me back to, you know, I, I've read 1984 a few times over the years. I think I read the cliff notes the first time because the exam was the next day. But, but I've read 1984 a few times over the years. And there are various terms in there that, that really bring home. For example, joy camp, the, the term joy camp in, um, in, in 1984 means a forced labor camp. <laughs> but it's a joy camp because we, you know, we all have joy when we go there. Mal reported is the term they use. The, the Times is the official newspaper of the government in 1984, and the and the government reports various things, and that's supposed to be taken as taken as uh, taken as gospel. And and every once in a while, the government wants to change the facts. <laughs> oh, we didn't really lose that battle; we were retreating. Uh, uh, it was a strategic retreat from that battle. We didn't really lose it; we strategic. And so, and so, when somebody raises, well, the Times said. Then, then, then the government. So the the news speak is well. That was mal reported. That right. It was. It wasn't that it was. It wasn't that it was right. And we're changing it now. It's that it was wrong then. It was mal reported. Even though it was the government's official newspaper, it was mal reported then. So you know there is this whole language. For example, for example, Alaska doesn't have taxes. Yeah, there's there's yeah. I've got something like that. Alaska doesn't have taxes. And, 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 you know, and when it's, when it's POMV 50, 50, uh, Alaska doesn't have taxes when it's POMV 25, 75, Alaska doesn't have taxes. Even when it gets down to, you know, we cut, we cut deeper than we needed to, we cut to POMV 25, 75 deeper than we needed to, the balance, of the budget, we still don't have taxes, uh, and the budget's balanced and that extra, uh, is, is a surplus. And I've got, I'm, I'm, this is a, a worksheet I'm writing this week's column. I'm going to write it about the Orwellianization of, of the language of Alaska fiscal policy. You know, the AS 3713-144B and, and the other statutes that are part of the POMB, according to, you know, in English, they're part of the law. They're a statute. But when you get to Newspeak, they're the law, the only law that really matters. Right. Forget about the statutory PFD. That's that. This is the law. And then AS 3713-145B, which is the, the PFD statute, you know, English in English, it's also part of the law. It's also a statute and it divides permanent fund earnings 50 equally between the use most important, the middle income Alaska families and, and, and those in the top 20 percent. But on the on the on the uh, the Newspeak side, they just don't talk about the statute. They just don't talk about the PFD statute anymore. It's like it's like it doesn't exist. It is a statute the same as the POMB statutes. It is part of the law the same as as the POMB statutes are part of the law, but they only talk about they only talk about the POMB statutes. They are the law, and then you get to you go on down through this list, and you get to you know fifty percent of the permanent fund earnings used to pay a PFD. Well, that's government spending. In the news speak, it's government spending, so we can cut it because it's government spending, or it's socialism, or it's a free ride. I mean, they they come up with these phrases to deride the PFD. And it's not only the legislators that are doing that. I mean, what's happened, just like in Orwell's 1984, the press has picked up on it. Right. And the press now uses these terms. And the pre and, and you go through it and, and, you, and you find press articles. Well, Alaska has no taxes. Well, yes, it does. It has PFD cuts. And it has deep, deep PFD cuts. I even saw an article 
that talked about that talked about the surplus in the in the in the FY24 budget. Give me a break. So what we have is the manipulation of language on the Alaska fiscal front every bit as much as we had the manipulation of language in George Orwell's 1984. And it's yeah. all meant to drive the narrative toward a, a specific outcome. And the specific outcome, right. going back to the first segment, is I don't pay, you all pay. Well, Orwell was very, he's a pretty smart fellow. <clears throat> and he understood that if you capture the language, you can capture the narrative. And then that in turn can drive everything that's happening. And that's what's going on right now. Like you said, uh, you know, we talked about the PFD. If you look back at what the what the writings of Hammond and other people was, they were very specific about what it, what it was and why they did it. But see, today that's changed. Like you said, now it's all socialism. Now it's all free ride. Now it's all this other stuff or it's government revenue and we need to cut it, uh, uh, cut the spending so that we can bring it back in house. It's all a capturing of the language. They've changed the narrative completely. And that's they they're very good at that. And and now we've got, you know, now we've an, another example is the statutory PFD. It's the statutory PFD. It's part of the law. It's a statute. But when you look at the newspapers, a statutory PFD is a mega PFD. Right. Big, mega PFD. POMV 5050 is a big PFD. Right. And 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 even POMV 75 isn't isn't just right. I mean, that's just it's reasonable. That's, it's a reasonable PFD, right? That it becomes reasonable or right. big or mega, or it's all the language that they use here. You could see that the whole thing's been captured. All right, 60 seconds, Brad. Go ahead and summate for us. <laughs> how do I how do I summate this? I, I know, I know. The, the the legislature is out of touch. The legislators are out of touch. They've put themselves in a position where they, they are no longer members of the Alaska economy. They're off in some other, some other fantasy land of their own creation. And now they're creating their own language to justify where they are. I don't know how we fix that, given the salary increase, but they are not representing 80% of Alaska families in their fiscal decisions. And something needs to change so that they get back in touch. They get back and connect back connected with the real Alaska economy and real Alaska families. I wish we had a magic pill for that. I don't know if there is one or not. I mean, yeah, you look at the double speak, you look at the news speak, you look at the fact that they won't answer the question of who pays. You look at the fact that they're shielding themselves, whether intentionally or not, from the bulk of the cost of government. I mean, if you didn't have to pay for anything, wouldn't you get every program you could? Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, that's a, that's a that'd be nice to have. Oh, that would help people right there. I mean, how are we going to pay for it? I'm never asking that question because don't worry, you'll just pay for it. I won't feel a thing. Um, I mean, that's essentially what it boils down to. It is, Michael. And, and, and the legislators, you know, you, you go back and listen to that, to that session at House Finance where they're saying, oh, the budget, yeah, we don't want to hear about that anymore. That's just, that's not, that's not real. And Delena chimes in on, on, on that issue. I mean, it just, that just, that, I, I just give up at that. I, well, I don't give up. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep, keep being here every week and I'm going to keep writing the column every week. But, but it, it's, 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 they're out of touch. They've lost connection with reality. They will say that they have connection with reality. They will say, Governor Dunleavy will say, he talks to the manager at the, at the Government Hill subway when he goes in, but he tells her what he wants on his sandwich. He doesn't talk to her about the life she's facing. <laughs> Wait, he's not discussing deep fiscal policy with a manager at Subway when he's there getting his foot long? I mean, they, they, people will say they're talking to their constituents, but when they get down to Juneau and they get in that conference room, they're using Newspeak to create a whole different world around them where, you know, those aren't real deficits. We don't want to hear about those anymore. All right, we just got we, all the permanent fund earnings are ours now. And it's just... <laughs> it's it's just it's yeah, it, it is. Unre we have created an un they have created an unreality amongst themselves. And it'd be humorous. It'd be nice to put in a cartoon if it wasn't so damn serious. Yeah. Donna says Milton Friedman said spending is taxing. Alaskans pay 18,000 per every man, woman and child. That's 18,000 that could be in the private economy, creating jobs and opportunity. I mean, that's how you have to look at it. Every dollar of government spending is a tax because it had to come from somewhere. So. There you go. There's a there's a big chunk of it right there. Um, 
it's it's oh my gosh ben just said to fix a problem requires a plan i wish we had one of those i mean i feel bad for you uh, ben i really really do i mean i just <clears throat> you're trying you're trying so hard and uh unfortunately it's like it's the little boy with his finger in the dike and there's just you don't don't have enough fingers or holes at this point to uh to match it all up it's, and it's not and it's not i mean god love it wish we could blame it on just the uh just the, the the house minority, but it's not. It's the it's the house majority as well. They're they're in on this on this discussion uh, as well. I mean, they're 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 using new speak language as well. Delano was part of the oh yeah the the budget doesn't represent the the plan doesn't represent you know reality anymore. It does represent reality. It is the reality. Awesome. It's the reality you want to avoid by using new speak. <sighs> Delena, I love you, dear, but it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, just just by avoiding the discussion of deficits, somehow is going to make them go away. Again, I just all I could see is la 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 la. I can't hear you. They're just putting their fingers in their ears. I just can't hear you right now. Um, all right, uh, Brad, <clears throat> two minutes. What? Uh, anything else you want to do? A bigger summation or anything else you want to talk about before we let you go this morning? No, I just think. Whenever, whenever Randy or anybody else sits to themselves and say, well, I don't want to pay taxes. Go back to that chart that Michael had up. Look at where you are on that chart. Look at what you're already paying and don't stop there. Don't stop. Well, I'm paying more. Yeah, but I can afford to pay a little bit more. Don't stop at that point. Think about what's going on in terms of the cross subsidy. You are paying more so that Sarah Hanning gets to pay, pay less. You are paying more so that Andy Josephson gets to pay less. You're even paying more so that at least Galvin, who's the who's who's the wealthiest member, the one with the highest income on house finance, you're paying more so that at least Galvin can pay less. The cross subsidies that are that are floating from the other 80% to the top 20%, particularly to those on house finance, particularly to those in the legislature, are just astounding. When, when Justin Ruffridge says, oh, I don't want to do a, an income tax. Hell no, you don't want to do an income tax. You're making money off of POMB 2575. I understand why you don't want to do an income tax. Right. But the other 80%, flat tax would be better for them. Yeah. I what? mean, Rand, Randy right now is paying at least four times, maybe six times, possibly even eight or nine times what Elise Galvin is paying towards state government, let alone people who are down in the lower 20% who are paying 18 times what Elise Galvin is paying towards government. I mean, and, and, and they're not just paying more. They are subsidizing Elise Galvin by paying more so that Elise Galvin can pay less. The cross subsidies, if you want to pay more, fine. But, but think about what you're, you think about who's getting the benefit of that. It isn't, it isn't K through 12. It isn't anything else. It's Elise Galvin. It's Sarah Hannon. It's Andy Josephson. They're the ones getting the benefit of you paying more because they get to pay less. <sighs> okay, Brad. <laughs> I don't know how to make it any clearer. I really, really don't know how to make it any clearer. Um, all right, my friend. Well, I appreciate you coming on board as always. It's a joy. It's <laughs> a joy. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again next week. It's the learning hour. How about that? Let's call it that. The learning hour. We'll do that. That'll be it. All right. Good to talk to you. Thanks so much. It's always good to hear from you, my friend. Thanks for being a part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.